Hello everyone, and welcome to Dark Souls 2. I'm Necromanticer, and the stunning example of manhood that you see before you is Faram, the god of war in the Drang Lake Pantheon, and patron of the Ferocian Lion Knights over in the land of Ferosa, over in the Shaded Woods. I'm going to be doing a fairly advanced playthrough of Dark Souls 2, just playing as I regularly would. I have have a particular build in mind, and fitting with the theme of the Feroz and Knights, it's going to be a very focused strength build. Grabbing the early Bandit Axe and Blacksmith's Hammer for really heavy, quick DPS, and much later in the game, planning on grabbing the Red Iron Twin Blade out of the Shrine of Amana once I get the chance. All of these weapons have sig received significant buffs from the newest patch, the calibrations in 1.08. So I'm really interested in trying them out, seeing how they handle, and depending upon what weapons I can get elsewise throughout the playthrough, I might also be using the red iron blades, the red rust blades, sorry, that you get from Vengarl after defeating his body, since they work really well with a strength build, and the upgrade with Twinkling Titanite, which none of the weapons that I have in mind do. As such, I want to have some sort of sync for those. As you can see, I've already looted the first section of the tutorial area. It was just a quick fight with the ogre, but that's a very necessary fight, especially on this character. The thousand souls that I gathered from that fight is going to give me enough to outright buy the first level up that I'm going to need and I need that first early level in order to wield the uh, homunculus mace that you get from pre-ordering the game. It's kind of cheap, but especially because it just received a base damage bonus of 15 per uh, base damage in the newest calibration, it's a very, very powerful weapon early game. I was messing around on a new bandit character, and it actually manages to take out all of these early hollows in a single wide attack with just no effort on your part. So that's really going to help me clear through the force of the Fallen Giants and the first little bit of the Lost Bastille before I can get my hands on a proper weapon. Uh, once I'm in the Lost Bastille through the Pursuer boss room, I'm going to be able to pick up the Craftsman Hammer, and from there it'll be a short matter to make my way over to No Man's Wharf, grab the Bandit Axe, and at that point I should have enough upgrades with Lenigrath in order to get the Blacksmith's Hammer, and my playthrough will be off to a pretty good start. Until then, I'm just going to be using the Broadsword. Once I've got the level and dexterity, I'm going to be able to grab the Homunculus Mace, as I said, and that should be enough to carry me through whatever I need. Boldstone, that would be useful if I'm heading down any sort of faith-related playthrough, but Boltstone and White Ring. Admittedly, not some of the best options I could have got. Probably should have kicked down that ladder, but it'll be no big deal to come back to later. I'm not going to enter any of the other tutorial areas, because I don't need to kill the other two ogres, as I don't have to get the ladle for this playthrough, and I'm not going to need their souls for anything, as well as the coffins that are important. And there's no loot down the other path that's of any worth. Only a amber herb, which I'm not casting, so isn't going to be an issue. And a cracked red eye orb. And since I'm not planning on doing any invasions, especially early level, that would just be worthless. I am going to come down here just so I can grab the morning star as well as the binoculars. The cleric's chime is never going to come in handy but I want to have a backup mace just in case the homunculus mace starts breaking during any of my early clears, and the binoculars are just really nice to have for any sorts of lore or getting a close look at certain parts of the area. I always start off the game by doing some quick little housekeeping here in Majula. There's actually a lot of really early items you can grab that will set you up fairly nicely. There's a Titanite Shard up here, so if you meet, reach Malentia early, you can immediately buy Lenagrass Key and start upgrading your weapon. I am going to be dealing with Malin, but I can't really pay him right now since I'm going to need this soul amount to level up. 
in order to get my decks. Quick Estus Flash Shard. It's always helpful. The more Estus you have, the more chances you have. Every little bit of Estus counts. Never forget that, people. Some free life gems. I'm honestly not too fond of life gems, just because I'm a bit of a collectionist and using any sorts of consumable is pretty abhorrent to me. It's just a uh, personal way I play, but that's how it goes. There's some homeward bones up there for if you need to farm a certain weapon off of early enemies. The only really important weapon that I could see that being terribly useful for, early game at least, is the Royal Greatsword that you could get from the Royal Swordsman over in the Lost Bastille, and that's not going to come into play for some time. Now that I've gathered up all the random consumables lying around, I can talk to the Emerald Herald. She will give me my flask, and she will upgrade both my level and my flask when she's done having her little lore bits. I've heard her dialogue quite enough that I don't need it repeated to me again and again. I'm very well versed in the lore of the series, and this early section gives you really nothing of note. I could kill her now just to get the aged feather and have free bonfire, not bonfire, but homeward bones for my whole playthrough, but it's honestly not worth the price you have to pay to resurrect her every time you have to level up or upgrade your Estus Flash Shard. It's just nice to keep all the NPCs alive, at least right now. Later on in the game, I'm probably going to come across a few that might come into an unfortunate accident, let's say, but not just yet. Grab the Rusted Coin in case I want to be farming anything, and onwards into the Force of the Fallen Giants. Swap out to the Homunculus Mace. Something that I've always noticed that's a little bit weird is these porcupine-looking quills at the front end of the homunculus mace. They don't really fit with the theme of it being a heavy blunt damage sort of weapon. I guess you could explain it from the perspective of the homunculus being a sort of biological experiment over an Aldeus keep, but I don't know. It just seems kind of out of place, given the growths that are the signature of the homunculus set. As for the early uh, DLC weapons that you can get, the only ones that are really worth anything are the Transgressor's Shield, which can be dark infused to give you a 100% darkness block, as well as this homunculus mace, which is a ridiculously powerful weapon for early game clears. Like, watch this. One shot, one kill. It completely trivializes early hollows. If you can get a strong attack or certain sweet spots against the weaker among them, it lights out for them. Especially because it comes out pretty fast, and it has the wonderful mace moveset that I'm such a fan of. That's why I'm going for a very early blacksmith's hammer. The two-handed mace moveset is just one of my absolute favorites of anything that they came out with in Dark Souls 2, and I really look forward to using it versus bosses. The shield and axe hollows have enough health that you can't dispatch them with a singular strong attack, so it's better just to do two quick light attacks. I would regularly be using the one-hand attacks on the homunculus mace, but I don't actually have the strength to wield it like that out of the bat. Only the warrior class has enough starting strength in order to wield the homunculus mace one-handed. So unless you're starting that character, there's no real point in attempting to one-hand this bad boy until you've gotten at least a fair amount of levels. As you can see, the two-handed mace moveset coming in handy as always. It has that wonderful backswing to it that allows it to catch a whole line of enemies. If you ever have enemies that are lining up without shields raised, a two-handed mace should make quick work of them. Any sort of hammer, blacksmith's hammer, craftsman hammer, homunculus mace, any sorts of weapons along those lines. As you saw, I made a quick jump over there and grabbed the throwing knives. Those are actually going to come in very handy, and if I have more than one or two left by the end of the Forest of the Fallen Giants, I'd be very surprised. That's either going to mean that I manage certain areas differently or manage to get a few drops because I have a very specific use for almost all of those throwing knives. There's many areas in the early 
levels where a little bit of range comes in really handy and the throwing knives are your best early option. I'm going to equip those while I wait for my stamina to regen because you can't start sprinting and thus you can't start jumping once you've lowered your stamina all the way down. But now I've got that. I have considered whether it's worth the time to go all the way around, but I'm not particularly worried at this point, so I'm just going to drop down, take that little bit of falling damage, and prepare myself to fight this Hyde Knight. And it now strikes me that I don't have my Estus Flask equipped. Let's, let's remedy that. That would be a silly, silly idea, going to this fight without Estus equipped. Get the dagger, just for that little bit of early damage. It'll do about 500 damage off the top of his health bar. Any sort of kicking attack will get him to stand up for you. And there we have it. 534 damage out of the gate. You can hit him while he's down and coming up. It might be a little bit risky, but... See, that's, that's the fight. That's all you need, and... While I don't have these stats to use that just yet, it's certainly nice to have. It'll only be one extra dex point until I can wield that, though I honestly don't intend to grab that point. But it is nice to have the option in case I want to swap the playthrough up to something a little bit different. As you just saw, that is the one, one little bit of bad side to the mace move set is that if they are very close to you on your right hand side, then you do have a chance of going right over their head, especially if you're using the strong attack. That actually comes out a little bit higher and more over to the left, so you've got a much better chance of missing if you try it that way. Bastard Sword. That is a wonderful drop that on most other characters I would immediately set myself up to use, but no, I'm trying to focus on very short range, really heavy strength weapons in this playthrough, so it's kind of out of the picture. Depending upon where exactly you stand when you throwing knife him, he can actually fall down and become much faster prey, but it's fairly inconsistent, so I never rely on it. That early hit will allow me to dispatch him with one quick one and not really have to worry about it, but it's it's nicer if he falls down. There's my first throwing knife, and was that a firebomb? It was. That'll allow me to lock the shortcut once I'm on the other side. It's always nice to get an early one because there aren't really any guaranteed firebombs here in the Forest of the Fallen Giants, at least until much later, if I remember correctly. And I don't plan on going down to the Soldier's Key route in order to get any of the items down there, so I don't believe I would actually get any guaranteed firebombs in the entire run. Here is where I would sort of start changing up my playstyle, or my method of clearing, depending upon what's happened. And since I've only used one Estus and have a full health bar, I'm actually not going to rest at the bonfire just yet. I'm going to head down the uh, path down there in order to grab the fire longsword and full clear that pit area. That will also give me enough souls to buy both Lenagrass Key and the uh, Ferris Lockstone from Lentia over here as well as, once I head back, I can upgrade my Estus Flask again with the shard that I just picked up. It also gives you the small soapstone sign, which, while not that important, can be useful if you and your friend are just barely out of soul memory range. The uh, small soapstone sign actually has a slightly larger soul memory range for co-op than the regular white soapstone sign does, so it can be fairly useful for getting that little bit of extra range if you just have to co-op with your buddy. I've actually done several playthroughs where I've uh, co-opted with a friend most of the way through the game, and it's a much different experience. It's really engaging, and everything just feels different. As you can see, the shield-wielding hollows will not go down to a single hit, but I can almost guarantee that every single other hollow down here will be easily dispatched. Unless I whiff, but he did too, so we can trade. Oh, dear. <laughs> that wasn't good. Luckily, I have an Estus Flask, but yeah, as you can see, possible chance of whiffing. But there we go. That was the wonderful backswing that really makes me love the two-handed mace.
it always hits slightly behind you, so if you're having trouble with... I want to get a quick stab on him because he just was not going to be in range. Uh, the backswing allows you to fight unlocked in combat as well as do a little bit of crowd control if you're facing large groups of enemies coming at you from a single direction. You can actually angle yourself sideways and hit the whole line of them as I was saying before. It's a very effective strategy that I highly rate. Because this guy isn't going to die to any sorts of quick hits from the mace, I wanted to get a much faster weapon to deal with him. And honestly, this should be the extent of the use of the dagger in this playthrough. Don't honestly look to be using it too much more. It's not a strength weapon by any stretch of the imagination. And it just doesn't have the damage that I'm looking for. Grab the Fire Longsword, which is a really nice weapon for any of you early casters out there. It gives you a lot of damage just for having very, very little points invested into any sorts of combat stats. Uh, once you have the base numbers in order to equip it, you can swing away and be doing rather large amounts of damage for what it's worth. Some people argue that the Hide Knight Sword is better, but that's only from the perspective that it actually has legitimate uh, strength and dexterity scaling. As you can see, the Fire Longsword has greatly diminished strength and uh, dexterity scaling in exchange for fire scaling, which isn't going to be useful early game, while the Hide Knight Sword over here still retains the CC scaling in both. So it's a much better choice for anyone who is going to be grabbing strength and dexterity. Though, again, for casters, not really too big of an issue. I've got 5,000 souls, and it's time to speak to Melentia. She will be giving me the Lenagrass key and Lockstone in order to get my early Chloranthi ring, and then I'll be back to Medjula to sort out both of those instances. Both upgrading my Estus Flash Shard and opening Lenagrass's uh, house in order that I may use him next time I'm there, if I feel so inclined. Something I actually am legitimately terrible at is remembering to use up all my Estus Shards or uh, Sublime Bone Dust whenever I'm in Majula, but I write that as part of the uh, failings of the central hub area. It's kind of a system that I'm not really a fan of. It stems all the way back to Demon Souls, and while they got rid of it for the most part in Dark Souls, it's made a return here in Dark Souls too, and that's just one of the few things that I have legitimate complaints about. It's just not how I would wish the game to be set up. Coming back to Cardinal Tower, and now I can begin the rest of my clear. I'm gonna come down here. Only three or four soldier hollows here in the Undercroft before I head outside to get most of the really good loot. Pick those back up on the way out. I want to come over here and kill this guy just so he doesn't get any funny ideas. Grab the soul. Let's see, what did I get? A life gem, that's always nice. Can never have too many of those. They actually stack, so popping multiples at once can be a really great way to make sure you're staying safe in a dicey situation where you could have damage coming in at any time. Here's the next use of those throwing knives I picked up. I want to quickly come over here and dispatch him as fast as possible, then move on to his friend, who is a spear-wielding hollow, the greatest of all sins. Juke him out and take him out immediately with a pair of throwing knives. That will make your entire time in this area so much easier, because otherwise you have to wait till after you've spoken with Kale in order to take him out, and that's such a long time with him just flanking arrows at you constantly, having to duck, dodge, dip, and weave in order to avoid all that damage that you just don't need to be taking if you can use a quick, early pair of throwing knives. Solves the entire problem. Come here and grab another Titanite Shard. There'll be a few others here in the level, but that's always one that I want to make sure I grab. Huh. Normally there's an archer there, but sometimes he abandons his post to try and melee you. I may have killed him as one of these two corpses here, but I wasn't necessarily counting, so I can't say for certain. Wait till he fires an arrow, make the jump, 
come around and get the backstab. If he hits you with his arrow while you're midair, it will stagger you midair and cause you to fall down. And so you have to be very careful that he doesn't hit you as you're making the jump. Otherwise, you will fall into the pool below. And clearly, hollows cannot swim, so that would be instant death. I'm not going to grab the item over there as I talk with Kale. It's just an amber herb, and since I don't intend to do any casting, at least until much, much later on, it's not going to be worthwhile for me to take the time to walk on over there. Grab his house key. That is honestly one of the most important bits of loot you can get in this entire area early on. It gives you access to three really, really worthwhile items. Not, not just three, four if you count the chest in, above. In the basement of the Majula Mansion, you get the Soul Vessel or whatever mystery item is going on currently. I believe it's the Murakumo, which kind of makes me want to start a dex build, but I don't actually like the Murakumo for PvE fighting, so I've thought better of it. But the mystery chest, just as a side note, there is a hollow down there guarding a bit of loot, but it's just a torch. So it's not worth the effort to go get it. The torches are kind of worthless in this game just because you get so many. So I don't rate actually heading down there to grab that. Wait for him to whiff. Get the... Oh! Goodness. That sucked me into the wrong animation. Well, that'll be the first Estus of this run. As I was saying, the... Uh, soul vessel or whatever mystery item is going on in the Majula chest mansion thing. It also gets you a free human effigy and another Estus Flash Yard. And most importantly of all, it gets you three free Titanite shards. Though That's enough to get any weapon to plus two right off the bat, as well as give you enough to get a weapon to plus three and another to plus one if you grab all the Titanite that's available quick pop that shortcut open just in case I need it later. Uh, as you saw, as I was facing the Spear Hollow, if you can get a sprinting attack while he's coming up these stairs here, he won't have his shield up, and as such you can dispatch him without any real problem. The only issue I ever have with dealing with Spearmen is their shield, which seems to be blocking at all times, so being able to take him out without having to worry is really nice. I haven't managed to consistently get this guy to fall prey to this trap here, so I found it's easier and simpler just to sprint into him. A lovely mount. The problem with these enemies is that their sprinting attacks come out very quickly, and there's several of them, so even if you dodge the first one or the second one, the others can still kind of pile up on you. It's going to be another Estus for my trouble, but I'm doing pretty well. There's only three more areas in this run before I'm back at the bonfire with enough souls to purchase the rest of Melentia's stuff. Quick open up this chest right here. It's trapped, but you can get out of that no problem. This door is a little bit interesting because while it's locked from this side, you can actually knock on the door and the hollows within will open up to see who's knocking on the door as it were. It's really sad that they didn't add more interesting mechanics like that throughout the game, but the Force of the Fallen Giants really seemed like a showcase piece of all the interesting things they could do. Just explosive traps, ferrous lockstones, uh, shortcuts, it's a bunch of really great stuff that... It feels like the Force of the Fallen Giants is a technical showpiece, and I guess it was because it was one of the first levels designed. And as such, it really has a lot of tender love and care that goes into all the ins and outs. It really has that Dark Souls feel that I love, and it's just kind of sad to see that the entire game didn't turn out to be as great. Not to say that I dislike it by any stretch. I mean, I've spent so much time with it thus far. It's got a much better combat system than the original Dark Souls, but I think the level design in Dark Souls 2 suffered a bit. Grab the slab and this Chloranthi ring. It's a nice ring to have just from the start of the game. Gives you a little bit extra stamina regen, which is useful for running around, sprinting, or recovering in certain dicey situations. Also equipping the life ring and stone ring just because I have free slots. 
I'm not going to bother with the white ring because I don't like the way it looks and it's just extra weight. But aside from that, I should be pretty set. Come on over here and kill him. Since he's a spear guy, he won't die in two light attacks. So I definitely want to use the strong attacks there. This is a little bit of a tight spot, but sprinting or jumping through allows you to skip going all the way around the giant in order to grab that bit of loot. And now we can come up here. For the third time today, these throwing knives are going to come in quite handy. Quick pop two of them off on him. And that will allow me to clear this entire section here without any struggles because of the witching urns that I picked up earlier in the level. Not only will they do almost the entire health bar of this guy and knock him down, but this hollow right here, because of your elevation and proximity, you can actually get a headshot for bonus damage, which will kill him outright. Jump on over and grab my soul and torch. It's nice to grab the soul, even though the torch isn't really worthwhile. And this item right here, which is another soul. Oh, no, infantry helm and mail breaker. For those of you who are solid mail breaker diehards, at this point, it's the closest thing to a consistent joke weapon that Dark Souls has. It's been in every single Souls game, all the way from Demon Souls through to Dark Souls 2, as you just found out. And it has been absolute rubbish in every single one of them. I'm completely convinced that FromSoft just keeps it in there because it entertains them. That people will actually use that as a weapon simply because they've included it. Because that's the kind of community that Dark Souls has. Up on over here. Quickly dispatch him. Because I was really close, I managed to get the perfect sweet spot damage and dispatch him in two light attacks. But if he was crouching down as the hollow was earlier, that would not actually have been possible. Get the backstab. Wonderful. It doesn't perfectly protect you from those two's retribution, but it does put you in a much safer spot and it takes care of the spear wielding hollow which is the biggest enemy in that I don't want to waste the weapon durability because I'm getting kind of low so I switched to my fist there because it was just one tick away as you can see there's an illusory wall here with a sorcerer's catalyst for any of you who want to be casting spells but didn't start as a sorcerer there's also an amber herb I grab that just because I'm addicted to secrets and any sort of illusory wall has got my attention no matter what it is. Throw him out. Oh, still got the hit. And I staggered him while well, he didn't stagger me, so I win the trade. You have to make sure this iron gate closes in order to get Pate to give you the uh, soapstone. And I'm going to want that because I don't really like the small sign soapstone just because it's a little bit harder to find, especially if you're not bothering with the name engraved ring. And I, I don't necessarily need extra stones, so it's not something that I'm actually interested in. Finish all that up. I'm just going to Estes here to be safe. want to keep your health as high as possible. This next area is one of the only really optional places for the throwing knives. As you can see, there's two spear-wielding hollows down there, and they can be a bit of a difficult fight if you don't aggro them one at a time, just because the spear-wielding hollows are the most dangerous of the hollows here in the Force of the Fallen Giants, and two of them, obviously, is going to be much worse. As you can see, if you can bait them into that three-hit combo, they leave themselves wide open right afterwards, and so you can just sweep on in. But depending upon where my health is and where my throwing dagger count is at, I may or may not decide to just plank one of them down with a pair of throwing knives. This enemy up here, I always take out with throwing knives. This is non-optional. He is going down with throwing knives because there is no chance in hell that I am facing a spear-wielding hollow on this narrow sword. Once again, we get the height advantage for the headshot which will immediately kill any of the hollows here in the uh, Forest of the Fallen Giants. And from there, we've pretty much cleared all there is to clear in the beginning section of the Forest of the Fallen Giants. If you can get the proper aim there, you can kill that Crystal Lizard in a single Witching Urn, but I wasn't paying attention and missed the first one, so it took me both. 
but it's no matter. I'm not going to need those for anything else. And the Crystal Lizard here is the only other place where I feel I'm guaranteed to use that. My weapon is about to break, so I'm not going to take on the giant down there just yet. As well as, I have some business with Valentia. Because I've already spent 5000 with her, all I need to spend now is an extra 5000 and then I will get her reward. Most of the merchants in this game have certain rewards that you can get from them if you either spend enough or go through enough dialogue options. And Melentia is just the same. Once you spent 5,000 souls with her, she will give you the Covetous Silver Serpent Ring plus one, which will increase all the souls you gain by 20%. You can get a free Covetous Silver Serpent Ring plus nothing later on in the game, but that will only increase by 10%. So it's much better to grab this one here especially because it allows you to clear both the bosses in this area and get the bonus souls from them. And since the bosses are the main source of souls here in the Force of the Fallen Giants, it's a really, really strong item to uh, boost your initial acceleration into the game. It'll really set you up to have that much more souls as you go throughout the game. On almost every playthrough I do, I never unequip that. Unless I'm specifically going into a PvP setting or am having difficulties with a certain boss and feel I just need that one extra ring. Kill all of them for these souls as I head on through. As you can see, I'm getting 108 souls as opposed to the regular 90 that I would normally get. That's because of the 20% extra. For those of you who don't know or just want an extra 90 souls, there's actually an archer on that platform. You can see him there. But he's just kind of waiting there as a little bit of a bait for anyone who wants to mess around with the elevators without actually heading down. You will get punished for that. This door is locked, and you won't get the key until much later. You can actually cheese around that with the silver cat ring, but there's nothing of import down there for me, so I'm going to completely ignore it. Here we have the last giant. He's really not, as you'll find if you head anywhere special in Black Gulch, but it's a nice title. I've heard a lot of people uh, conjecture that he's actually the imprisoned giant lord that you kill in the memory of Jay, but I don't really agree with that for a pair of reasons. Not only do you actually kill the giant lord in the memory of Jag in order to get the uh, giant's kinship, but also there's several other models of giants that look just like this. All the trees you actually find around the Forest of the Fallen Giants. So we know there are multiple giants that have this same model. There's no reason to actually suspect that this one in specific is... Uh, the giant lord, especially because we saw that he died. You killed him yourself. I mean, at least if you finish the game, you certainly have. Most of his attacks, if not all of them, can be avoided simply by walking away. If you get greedy like that, you will have to spend some stamina and roll out, but it's no matter. Oh, again, getting greedy, but that is the kill shot, so that's all for him. Uh, no Estus, wonderful. Soul of the Giant, and the Soldier's Key. Soldier's Key will allow me to grab a ring and a few torches, as well as head on to face the Pursuer in his proper boss fight arena. I'd consider just fighting him on the uh, little plateau platform looking place after the shortcut here in the Force of the Fallen Giants, but I thought better of it because I'm going to immediately want to go to the Lost Bastille in order to get my Craftsman Hammer. And so, there's no real point, because I'm going to have to head down that way either way. Soldier's Key on through here. This gets you a little healing ring that can be very helpful if you're running low on healing items, or if you're new to the game, it's very helpful to have that little bit of just solid regen. There's no... Uh, penalties to having it on other than it could break if you take a lot of equipment damage 
but early game that's never going to happen as you'll die far before you actually have any sorts of equipment breaking at least in your ring slots heal him just for a little bit of extra souls when coming through this direction you always want to roll out because they can combo you together if you get hit there and that's a very bad idea Get the unlock combat to swing right into the backstab didn't even have to sprint it's a pretty nice kill kinda happy with that come on through here another use of the soldier's key and here we are sprinting attack to make sure I get him before he gets his shield up we trade blows but of course I'm going to win I've got the completely overpowered homunculus mace and the stone ring there's no way he's not getting staggered not only do maces have ridiculous amounts of stun capacity just by the nature of their weight and moveset but the stone ring just pushes me over any sorts of edges that might possibly stand in my way that little sliver of health I'm missing isn't going to make a difference in this fight, so I'm not going to bother Estesing it. The Pursuer is actually a fairly easy boss if you know how to handle him. Most of his attacks can be dodged either very simply like that or by walking to his right. Just always walk to his right and you will have a very easy time of it. If he uses that horizontal slash, roll left so that you're heading through the sword and your iframes are spent on the sword itself. That we that one attack is one of the two moves that cannot be dodged without rolling. You can't just walk around that. Uh, there we go. Have him swing again. Roll behind him. I took a free hit earlier, but it's no matter. He's still going to be a piece of cake. Walk to the right again. Just constantly circle him. The mace has a very powerful moveset for this. It's just very quick, very in his face, very spammy. Oh, that wasn't good. I'm not going to bother healing because, again, this fight's basically over at this point. He's at no health. I'm getting free damage off pretty consistently. Do your jump. Walk right under that. This will be the final hit. There we go. Nice and easy fight. Took a pair of hits that I didn't really need, but came out far ahead. And that gives us the Ring of Blades, which is easily the best alternative to the Life Ring. I don't really like the Life Ring, but it does have a legitimate effect early game, so you might as well until you have a better ring to replace it with. Drop down here to grab the Drang Lake set, in case I want some heavier armor early in the game. I'm not going to use the shield or sword, just because that's not the kind of playthrough I'm going through for. But those are pretty nice weapons to have if you're heading down that kind of path, either turtling behind a shield or running a sort of dexterity greatsword build, possibly working into the one of the weapons from the DLC. I'm not going to make any spoilers. Also, that Drang Lake shield is the first physical shield that you can get that actually has a 100% physical block. That is a full clear of the Force of the Fallen Giants, barring the one little soldier's room that I don't really see a point in doing, so I'm going to head on over to the Lost Bastille, spend a bunch of my souls in Medulla before I actually head throughout the level, and then come back to grab the Craftsman Hammer, and that should be enough. Head on back to Medulla. I'm actually going to get enough points and strength to be able to one-hand this now, especially because the Craftsman Hammer, which I'm about to grab as well, will take at least 20 strength to one hand properly. And the one-handed moveset is one of the reasons why I really rate the hammers as opposed to maces themselves. I'll give you a little demonstration once I actually pick that up. I'm going to get my strength to at least high strength value. I could just completely pump it. I mean, that's a little bit silly, like I'm going to want some more endurance and vitality, but 30 strength is a very nice number to start with, so let's just dump all that in there. And let's head... oh, I have an Estus Flash Shard, so let's get that out of the way before I head onwards, because I know I'll forget if I don't do it now. There we are, upgrade the Estus Flash Shard. Did I... oh, goodness, I need to grab that from the Medulla Mansion. I was forgetting. Now that I've upgraded my strength and have the Ring of Blades equipped, the skeleton should 
be an utter breeze, especially because he's already weak to bludgeoning attacks. So this homunculus mace is going to cut through him like a hot knife through butter. Come on over here to grab a ferrous lockstone. It's useful for a certain shortcut over in the Lost Bastille, as well as it replaces the one that you buy from Malentia if you don't actually want to get the Covetous Silver Serpent Ring. All you have to do is talk to Kale. Yeah, see, two hits from my 30 strength and Ring of Blades with the Homunculus Mace. Completely unupgraded, by the way. And he just falls down flat. No contest. Let's see what we have in here. Yeah, it's the Murakumo still. Normally, you wouldn't be able to get this until at least Brightstone Co. Seldora. So, if you've ever liked the weapon and wanted to make a playthrough that's actually focused on it in PvE, now would be the time. Come on over here. This is one of the best drops in this entire place. Three Titanite Shards. That is so much value, it's just silly. That's half the upgrades needed to get you completely out of the Titanite Shard range. Now that I've killed that skeleton, uh, Kale will actually come down there and you can complete his quest line once you've explored most of the bonfires. And since I completely exhausted the dialogue options of Malenti over there, she's now come over here as a merchant. Head on over to the tower apart, and now I'm ready to clear out that last little bit. It's a pretty short stretch, but there's quite a lot of stuff here. There's this little side section with a radiant life gem and another large tartanite shard gonna be able to take my bandit axe to plus six if all goes according to plans right out of the box because of all the large titanite here this barrel here is actually there for a reason if you knock it down it will cause an explosion and actually kill all three dogs that are down here without you having to jump down yourself I recently had a little bit of a mishap with them recently so I wanted to be extra careful to do that properly this is the covetous silver serpent ring that I was talking about earlier it's worse than the one I have on now so there's no point there's an item back there but that chest also grants you the antiquated key which is absolutely vital to a certain shortcut you can take through the lost bastille that will make it completely optional to face the ruined sentinels though I do plan on doing so anyway Oh, I could poise through that. Wonderful. With the buffs to poise in this newest patch, I'm really happy with the idea of running a higher strength, more tanky playstyle. In the end, I plan on grabbing Vengarl's set to complement the Red Iron Twin Blade and some of the Red Rust weapons if I actually use those. It's just a very strong set now that it's got extra poise. Its defenses have been nerfed a little bit, but I, I honestly think that was a very fair change. Pre-patch defenses were far too powerful, especially in later game time. So having a small reduction in that's power is honestly a good change for the meta and the game at large. Three strikes into a strong attack, and he falls. That is wonderful. I can completely lock him out of combat. All of these dogs die in a single hit. I'm feeling pretty pretty good about this run right about now. Everything's going well. I haven't even died yet, so I've got that going for me. Hell, this might even turn into a no-death run if all goes according to plan. I suppose every run's a no-death run until you muck it up, but we shall see. Come on in here for the three hit into the kill shot. Lightly tap this barrel. If you tap it from the just right angle, it will not blow up. Bugger all. Depending upon how you knock that down, it's a little bit chaotic. It's very, very touchy. Depends on how exactly you knock it down. It can either explode or not explode. As you can clearly see, it did no such thing this time, so my only option is to hit it with a fire sword. Take a little bit of damage, but I'm right here at the bonfire break that secret open. Before I actually rest at the bonfire, I want to light that sconce there so I can get Lenagrast off his lazy butt and I can grab the items out of his chest. He is actually hiding the strongest weapon I can even think of grabbing this early in the playthrough, at least from a base damage 
standpoint. This is the fabled craftsman hammer. Starts with, let's check. Yeah, 166 base damage, as well, uh, only plus four, what? What's my, wait a minute. Oh, I didn't realize it takes 10 dexterity. Looks like I've got something that I'm gonna need to level up when I get back to Majula. That's frustrating, but oh well. I'm not using the souls for anything else at this point, so one point's not going to matter too much. But yeah, as you can see, it has 166 base value, and it actually has a 75% scaling on strength right out of the bat. So that will do a lot of damage to any sorts of enemies, especially the old knights over in Hyde, who are incredibly weak to blunt damage. Any sort of blunt damage coming their way is going to wreck their day. You see, I told you I'd forget the Estus Flash Shard. It always happens to me. But take care of that. Level myself up. Increase my dex by one and get some more endurance. A little bit of extra stamina never hurt anybody. And now I'm set to make my way over to hide. I'm going to tag the first bonfire there, and that'll be it for the playthrough. At least this first little episode. I also want to just kind of show off the Craftsman Hammer in pitched combat because believe me it will make short work of the old knights down here if I was being more of a speedrunner I would remove my armor just for the bonus stamina regen because unlike in Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls stamina regen is actually based on your equip weight the little percentage you can see down the bottom right when you go to your equipment screen because I'm at basically 50% equip weight, my stamina is regenerating slightly slower than it would if I was, say, at 20% equip weight. And if you're speed running, that's a really big issue. In older Souls titles, the stamina diminishment was actually attached to specific armor pieces, so you could just load up on weapons and have no armor, and no matter what your weight was at, you would still have the same stamina regen. But here in Drang Lake, Dark Souls 2, it's actually a function of your overall weight. So if you're being a weapon master with a lot of light armor and a lot of heavy weapons, you're still going to have the same exact stamina regen problems as someone who's a complete tank wielding the warp sword. Just a very light, quick weapon. Normally they don't up open up with that, but it's no matter. It's really quick. Just three quick strikes, and he is down for the count. Grab the Pale Stone, light the bonfire, and that will be all for today. Thank you so much for watching, and you have a good day.